Oh, oh, oh. call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll start our meeting with you know, invitations for public comment. Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, <coughs> the chair's report, and essentially for the, the good of the organization. I just uh, want to mention I was looking, rolling through the, the website today, and if anyone has any, I know the website is being updated and changed and renovated or whatever. So if you've had a chance to had a chance to do that or have not, I suggest take a look at the website, see how you're feeling about it, be able to find the things you want, and, and if you have questions about it or recommendations or suggestions to, you can let Julia know and we'll get to the people in the know. Okay, superintendent's report. Uh, it's, uh, Dr. Bacall has tripped to Hanover Fair and there's some papers associated with it on the, on the Table and also on page, page on page four, starting page four in the packet. And I also have a couple of things on the uh, laptop I want to share with the, with the committee. So how this has evolved. Uh, when I was in uh, San Antonio, I went to the trade at the ACTE and the NOCTE meeting. You may recall I'm on the executive board of NOCTE, the National Occupational Competency Testing Institute. NACTI pays for all my travel to go to the National ACTE every year and then another meeting in the spring. Anyway, I, I met with this company called Festo, who we had um, is a robotics company, an integration manufacturing company. I was talking about our new school. And there's another round of grants coming out. We were talking about what we'd done so far. They actually did some research on Minuteman. And then um, someone nominated me to attend this Hanover Fair with Festo. In other words, it was I think it was a, a company that we had worked with and bought some equipment through. And they said, well, if you want to, um, I guess every one of their vendors gets to nominate somebody once a year. So they nominated me, and, and uh, I was approved. <coughs> and uh, I talked to Dave about this because Festo if it's in there, Festo pays for everything except the the train fare. I mean the uh, air fare. I don't think it's in there. Huh? Yeah, you know, the train would be kind of long, like six months. But <laughs> so the, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Hanover Fair. So anyway, I talked with Dave about it. Dave approved it, and then. Kevin and I were talking about it, and he had just been to an ethics commission meeting and suggested I call the state ethics commission, which I did. And I was explaining to her, I sent her the documents, and she said, you know, this looks fine to me, but if in a couple of years you end up doing business with this company, you'll need to file another form, which is a very regular thing to do, but why don't you have your school committee vote it? <coughs> and uh, then if you ever do business with this company, fill out another form and everything will be in accord with our regulations. So that's why it's <clears throat> in front of you tonight. And I just wanted to, the Hanover Fair in, in, is a huge trade show, I guess you would call it, which is focusing on something called Industry 4.0, which from my understanding of what that term means, it's about the integration of robotics, manufacturing, um, software applications for a variety of different industries, including biotechnology, environmental technology, biometrics, um, bionics, um, and Festo is, I guess, a leader of integration manufacturing. And he, the, the folks at the Festo described it to me as, imagine the Boston Convention Center times 30 they have over a quarter of a million people visit this every year. And um, this is, I'm just going to go up here. Festo
results when the know-how of employees does not match with the requirements of employers, companies, or entire industrial sectors. Closing these skills gaps in technical vocational education is challenging. There's a lot of theory to be learned and experience required about how to put this knowledge into practice. You need a training facility, qualified trainers, curricula, and training contents, as well as appropriate learning systems and laboratories. But most important is to have someone who understands how all these elements can be interconnected. Managing all these topics is quite a big challenge. This is why Festo Didactic will help you close your skills gap and solve your educational challenges. Festo Didactic is the single source for designing and operating learning centers customized for your individual requirements. Our services range from building consultancy and turnkey equipment solutions to providing qualified trainers and management staff, combined with modern and practical curricula. In other words, being a full managed educational services provider. Drawing from our industrial background as part of the Festo Group, we offer practical vocational educational programs focusing on industry demands. As the world market leader in technical vocational education, we know best how to make this happen. We will share our experience and fully support you from the start because we know what really matters. Focusing on employability and providing people with the skills they really need to best perform their jobs. Whether our services are affiliated with an industrial company or we establish an independent vocational training center, we have all the tools and experience to close your skills gaps in technical vocational education by being your preferred managed educational service provider. Technical vocational education from one single source worldwide. Festo Didactic. Two, two, oh my goodness, two questions. This is right distance. Uh, about how much will this cost? And why do you think that this week at this fair is more valuable than possible other experiences you could have this time of year? What did that caught your attention to say that this is the thing I should spend a week at? Uh, plain, uh, it's just a plane fare and the train to this somewhere around a thousand to fourteen. I've seen on the orbits travel lots. Um, I just when I look at what we're doing with advanced manufacturing and some of the partnerships that we've created recently because of that program, one being Insulin and Acton, who's adding 400 people, and they're looking to us for some other training um, as they go through the process of scaling up in Acton. I think if I'm have a better understanding of some of these global partnerships that these companies are already involved in, it just would add a bit of value to our business partners looking at that. Gary, it has been over 15 years since I worked in manufacturing, but even then, it was very much an international and not a national um, phenomenon in terms of. Stuff, and I support this story. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I guess I'll. 
the Germans are famous for their um, apprenticeship programs. You know, I've heard them talked about at the meetings I go to about the German apprenticeship program being a, you know, something we need to think more about here. And I'll be visiting a vocational school for setting that up. Yes, Karen. As a matter of fact, I was host family to um, some kids who were in vocational training in Germany and Austria. Um, who came here to do a semester at one of our community colleges, um, but it was very strictly um, college level manufacturing activity, and they were coming here for some of the theory, but the practical stuff was all in Germany. Yeah. Very good. Anyone else? Alice? Is there any way to tie it to one of your roles? Um. I was thinking about the academy model goal um, in terms of integration because the maker spaces, you know, the toil lab and the project based learning spaces in each academy are sort of the, <clears throat> the jewel in each academy. And the toil lab, especially in, the, in that academy, you know, we have a sense of what we're doing there, but I don't have a sense of how deeply we can integrate and use that space. Because it's almost like we're setting up a, and I don't want to say a mini shop, but another shop that's sort of a combination of robotics, engineering, manufacturing, and some of the trades. And I don't really have a clear sense of that. And I, that would be one of my objectives here. And I told them that if I want to go, I want to see what we call maker spaces, and they sort of laughed and said, well, we have companies on when Ed and I talked about it, I also uh, <clears throat> asked him to uh, prepare a report, prepare a report for the fact what is no way learned and how it applies to, how it might apply to uh, Minuteman and, and vocational technical education. So we will do that with, at some point when he returns. Anything else? Uh, seeing none, we'll take a vote. All in favor? Any opposed? None, so it's Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring you up to date on, I think it starts on page seven, are some letters from the different workforce development boards. We've talked many, I don't know, it feels like we've talked many times over the years about a vet assistant program. Um, so we've we met with a uh, significant business partner called Blue Pearl. <coughs> They're the largest provider of specialty veterinary hospitals in the country. And they have a facility in Waltham, one in Charlestown, and they're opening up another facility nearby. And they came to us asking us if we could help them deal with their skills gap when it comes to really all levels with the exception of veterinary surgeons. They have more surgeons than they need, but they don't have veterinary nurses, veterinary technicians, veterinary assistants. So we met with them, I think, back in the summertime. And it evolved over a few meetings. We talked to the Department of Ed. We did some of the requirements in regards to assessing the student interest, which we did with a survey of incoming ninth graders. I believe the survey results are in here. And we talked with, we sent a letter to the Department of Ed initiating what they call Part A now. The, the process for Chapter 74 approval has been revised again. And to be honest with you, we weren't aware of some of the most recent revisions which happened in the last few months. So we're going through that process and we've met with the Department of Ed. Um, we formed an advisory committee. We've looked at um, workforce development demand data had our workforce development boards um, review the data as well and write letters of support. Um, we had letters from business um, and veterinary vet, veterinarians in the, in the area. You can see on page 10 we have quite a, I think, a, a powerful animal science program advisory committee with people from, uh, of course, Blue Pearl as well as UMass. 
former Mount Ida campus, which um, is still actually teaching veterinary technician training, but it will end soon. Um, and then there were some folks on the phone that were associated with the Massachusetts Veterinary Association, all in support of the program. So um, we've submitted some of the basic requirements. One of the new things that the department requires and Julia has, it's a, it's a listing of people who sign off and they want a signature from every one of the school committee members um, saying that um, the application was discussed at a school committee meeting. Once part A is completed, we have another meeting with the Department of Ed, I think tomorrow or Thursday. Um, then part B begins, which is really just looking at facilities and curriculum. There is a state framework for animal science. Uh, there have been three or four other vocational schools that have added veterinary assisting in the last few years, and the modifications to the curriculum were in that line. Blue Pearl has some ideas about what they want to see in the curriculum. Uh, and, uh, just So we're going to go for post-secondary approval and secondary approval at the same time. High school students can sit for what's called the veterinary assistance, assisting exam. Post-secondary students with additional uh, competencies can sit for the veterinary technician credential. Okay. This is all very confusing, and I have two degrees in animal science, but uh, there is no nationwide uh, credential. And one of the things Blue Pearl wants to be able to do as part of the partnership with Minimum is to work nationally to develop some consensus around a national credential. And then there's also a great need for what they're calling veterinary nurses now. Um, and the, the term nursing nurse is not really highly regarded by the American Medical Association, but the Veterinary Association thinks it's appropriate. And when we reviewed our, our health assisting program, and the curriculum that's already there in health assisting, they found a lot of uh, common core competencies to a veterinary nurse program. So it would also open up opportunities for our students in health assisting to look at the veterinarian world as an occupational choice uh, with additional training after Minuteman, of course. Blue Pearl has also expressed an interest in possibly having a veterinary clinic here on Either, you know, who knows what we're going to do with the Tremont School or what happens after, you know, phase three of the, uh, you know, looking at partnership opportunities and what sort of facility might be needed. But um, and if you looked at some of the other models at Monty Tech or Worcester Tech or even a little bit at Neshoba, they all have some sort of veterinary clinic association with a veterinary office. Uh, and so having Blue Pearl and their resources was, uh, is really compelling and exciting when it comes to looking at this program at this particular time. Questions? So, oh. <laughs> Um, as far as the new building, do we have space? Not in the new building. We so, do for classroom activities okay. and for some related lab activities, but the clinical part, I'm not even using the term, the clinical part would have to take place at a veterinary clinic. Okay, so that would be one of the reasons to have the partnership. So and have, have it here. And have it here. Yeah. Or Waltham is right there. And then okay. So you can maybe, you can, there's room for an additional course of study as far as classroom space. And yes. Sure. Uh, I assume that we've uh, reviewed the salaries that people earn in these various professions and those are satisfactory. Yes. Is that part of our packet here? Is that well, if you read the, I believe the letters from each of the mass hire boards, the workforce development boards, 
they don't, I don't know if they say anything in particular, but we did look at that. We have another. Part of our submission is the salaries. So these are real career, uh, reasonable career oh, paths. Oh, yes. yeah. And, and uh, so we would only have classrooms here. We would not be housing any animals here. Depends. You know, clinics, you, the animals come in. If you're going to work on animals, they have to be here. But the clinic would not be here. It could be, yes. I hope it is. Meaning, what was that? Not on the campus. They have to build something else for Or renovate part of the, tr the building we have up there. And um, do we have an idea of the cost of the specialized equipment to launch this effort? Well, Mount Ida is going to have some surplus equipment very soon. And one of our board members is a board of trustee for Mount Ida. And they recently, they renovated that whole facility, I think, within the last five years. So that was brought up by a board member, by a, one of our program advisory board members who's on, the, actually was an instructor at Mount Ida. And this, the, the teaching, finding teaching staff for this is possible to do? Through, I think through Blue Pearl, and other cooperating veterinarians, the clinical site instruction is going to be fairly straightforward. And uh, you would need to have a licensed animal science instructor for the other component of them, which I am. You can hire me when I retire. <laughs> well, um, we've talked about this over the years, actually. I remember you bringing up every once in a while, almost from the wishful thinking part. It would be really great. There's a need for it. A lot of kids would be interested in it. So I was a little surprised, though, to see it at this level in our, in our packet. And I'm very happy to hear all the kind of connections you've already made and the fact you're able to answer my questions so easily on this, uh, demonstrating the level of thoughtfulness. And I think it would be a lot of um, uh, fun and uh, a great thing if we could successfully bring this kind of program over. The other thing, when you mentioned Mount Ida, a former friend of the school who was on our building committee and very active on uh, chairman of the board, is probably still or was chairman of the board at Mount Ida, which is currently with us. Oh, that's right. He told me that. That's right. Um, I think it would be really popular, uh, especially in the rural communities. And also, um, I wanted to know how long you think the Department of Ed will take to do the approval? And what are the new things that you think uh, are beneficial about the Chapter 74 approval process? Well, but as it's outlined in the process, they would make an initial approval as early as this October. Um, which, if you think about it, what like what we've done with multimedia engineering and with advanced manufacturing, you know, fresh, the freshman experiences can be done almost anywhere, and even sophomore experience. So um, what do I like um, with the Department of Ed? This process. Oh, okay. Chapter seven. Yeah. The application. The application. Um, I'll tell you. I, I'll tell you one. And I told them this. For, for It was sort of like the what is really good about Part A is that it requires schools who want to access Chapter 74 funding to do a real job when it comes to assessing workforce demand data. Um, because, you know, a lot of times that was skimmed right over. Um, it also requires, and it requires documentation uh, that student interest has been assessed for. So, you know, remember our six indicators here at Minimian? The three indicators that are required by the Department of Ed had traditionally been the number of openings, the living wage, and student interest. And we've always added three more, a strategic partner, emerging technologies, and the existence of other training within a 10-mile radius. Well, they have incorporated our six indicators into this process in one form or another. For instance, if we were within five miles of another veterinary technical program, we would have to consult with one another. The schools would have to consult with one another. A lot of that's a little bit still 
fuzzy, but the good thing about that is let's say Lexington High School or Arlington High School and this new high school wants to add an engineering chapter 74 engineering program, they can't do it without consulting me. And the superintendent has to sign that they've been consulted. Merely consulted or agreed? Merely consulted. So you hit on the one thing I don't like. Um, so, so in terms of the transition of, of the program, I mean, are, is it is it possible that you know it starts off maybe in the sophomore year as sort of being a lot of shared classes with the health health assisting program, and then sort of go into more of a specialty track junior and senior year, or, or, or is it going to be a completely separate track from the start? That's a, I don't. I hope we can do some common core instruction. That's sort of the why we put pathways together that way that we did. Because a lot of the common core competencies in ninth and tenth grade are very similar. And you could perhaps for some portions of the curriculum have a common core instructor who's teaching to students from three or four different vocational technical programs. You know, I've always thought that was possible. Okay. And then um, you, that you mentioned some other strategic partners in, in, in the veterinarian field. Um, you know, I just noticed on the technical advisory committee there are three people from uh, Blue, Blue Pearl and yeah. no one else. And, and it would be good, I think, just to have at least one non-Blue Pearl vet person. Yeah, there are actually oh, several. Okay. Like, that they may not have been at that meeting, but which is the day? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is November. And then, and then, just speaking of dates on, on, on the next page, it talks about Part A due last month, and I so I mean, so we're so we're not on the schedule here. Is is there a new? They schedule? gave us an extension. Okay. They gave us an extension mainly because their process was so new. Just one, Carrie. Can, Al, did you get your your question answered? You did have a follow up. My question is uh, whether you would consider this, whether you were imagining it as household pet kind of veterinary services or whether it would be livestock or wild animals, which are much more difficult to find in this area. We've had that discussion. It's going to be primarily companion animals at this point. I, I, I can understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although I was advocating based upon our district. Once this gets a little further, I'd reach out to some of the other you know, animal enterprises, especially the equine folks that are in our district. Good idea. So there's a piece of paper that may have gone back to Julie at this point. Oh, have you passed it around? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Well, thanks. So by that, I, I would assume that we endorse what the meeting has with this project. Yeah. From what we understand of the process, we don't really need a vote or anything. It's just that we had a formal discussion at an open. You know, and that this paper is all new. So the signing the paper indicates that, that we've had that. Not merely the discussion, but we, we supported it. Yes. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Jeff? I move that we, uh, that the school committee, uh, extend their support on pursuing veterinary program as specified in the documents presented to us today. Any, dis any, further, or any discussion on that motion? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? No, so it's 9002. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Goal number two. Do you have anything to say to introduce that or should we do <laughs> Oh, no, this is, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jim Gamble from Belmont, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is the next step. I think, I think this is sort of the end of the, of the um, 
you know, of this whole of this whole process. Uh, this is again about the Section 10B tuitions for the non-member towns, um, and I, I that I really appreciate the conversation we had at the special enrollment um, meeting where we were talking about this, but in the context of you know, would it make sense to um, start start engaging the non-member towns in terms of um, in terms of a partner tuition agreement? And I heard a, a lot of things. I heard. Know, um, we don't want we don't want to be in the business of um, negotiating uh, uh, sort of a deal by deal basis for towns. Um, we you know we want the non-member towns to have some clarity about whether they want to become a member or not. Um, uh, I I heard you know that there is that there is a lot there's a there's a distinction between these type A towns and type B towns and should we be focusing on trying to um, free up access for students from type B towns and to to come in and and uh, put our put our power behind trying to get Desi to change those regs versus versus the tuition regs for the type A towns um, and then you know just um, a lot of good questions about what you know what's involved here and and I heard at one point in the conversation that it sort of said well maybe maybe we should just um, you know go sooner rather than later to ask Desi what is what is possible. And so, and so, I, and so I took all that, um, had some other conversations and thoughts, and, I've, and I came back to the officers last week with a proposal where we go to Desi um, seeking, a, um, seeking to fix our tuition policy for non-member towns. Um, we were the first regional Vogue Tech School Committee to do so under the uh, chapter 74 section 7c language that currently is in is in the state law and really asking them for a five-year blessing for a process that would gradually bring our our tuition our our tuitions for the non-members for the type A towns from the current desi cap rate up up to what our section 10b average cost cost is um, on your table there's one you know, slight change to the proposal that came out of our officers um, conversation where it was clear that even though we might be able to affect the fiscal 20 tuitions, it probably made sense not to, not to have any change there because, you know, towns are well in the process of trying to budget what, what that is. And so, um, but, the, but, but this whole notion of a transition sort of mirrors what is, um, in the regional agreement, in terms of offering non-members uh, or who want to become members a gradual transition on the capital cost side, this is simply doing it, uh, um, having a similar transition plan for those who choose to stay non-members, but bringing the bringing the tuition from the you know from the from the Desi cap rate up to our marginal cost. Um, you also saw last month the letter from Deputy Commissioner Jeff Wolfson, who um, said, you know, while we do have the legal right to ask the commissioner to approve a schedule, he said, you know, it, we would have to show we would have to show unique and extraordinary circumstances. And so to sort of try to think through that, I went through several drafts of a letter that we might want to consider um, that would that would that would. That would that would make that case, and um, you know, on page eight, 18, I just sort of summarize the the four main points that I see is that first, you know, that we have this right. No one's ever tried it. Um, Desi uh, needs to recognize that a that a vote, uh, that a regional vote school can petition to set its rate. Second, when you go back to the history of the of the 2015 regulations, which they described as a compromise um, where they gave Minuteman the capital cost increment but they but they took away access to the ninth grade students to the exploratory programs and they also lowered the cap rate that whole back and forth was between the between the regional vote schools and and, and the type of type B towns and it was mostly Boston and um, the Medford of superintendent 
that had the strongest the strongest on commons there. And so and so the compromise took place between between the towns that already have access to regional vote, I mean to 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 vote at schools. And what we're talking about in this proposal is is uh, is not changing the tuitions for them, not changing that regulatory compromise that they came up in 2015, but instead just focusing on those um, towns that don't have any sort of vocal school of their own, either locally or through membership in a regional school, up school district, and and um, and and so we're saying that we're not really asking them to change what they decided, but instead there's a new set of circumstances, and maybe one of the reasons they never even sort of talked about type A towns and tuitions then is that there were very few. And in fact, it wasn't until we, we had a new regional agreement that let the declarant towns choose whether or not to leave and then a separate process by which Belmont chose, you know, chose up to leave. We've suddenly gone from having just really one major, I mean, one significant type A town, Watertown, to where we now have seven or eight. And, and so, you know, th there's no way that the DESE, uh, that the board could have, you know, foreseen in February 2015, the circumstances that followed, that, which was a new regional agreement and the Miniman, Miniman district shrinking from 16 towns down to, down to nine, while all those towns are still choosing Miniman as their primary vote ed uh, su supplier, so sort of, Talk about, I mean that that I think qualifies as a you know as a unique and exceptional um, circumstance, um, and then and then also just sort of you know say look this is this is this is an important time for Minuteman where we're that we're about to move in up to the building we've made great progress with the program we, we're we're a blue ribbon school we have seen that these towns that have left still want to to engage with us and work with us. Um, and you know it's going to take some time to sort of make it make it work. But 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 the only way I think that Watertown and Belmont in particular think about coming in um, is to be able to close this gap on the financial side to take that off of the table within within those towns. You know they have to decide whether or not they want to make sure they have an access to the Miniman programs. Um, and 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 if 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 the if the strong financial advantage that um, that the current regulations offer is going to be phased out, then then the whole conversation there can shift to what is best for the um, kids um, kids there, rather than saying, well, this is this is a way to save a half a million dollars, and we'll deal with the fact that the school may fill up fill up on the, in a you know, couple of years. So I think it's. I think it's. Um, I think. I think it's not. I mean, I, I will always be happy with another half a million or a million dollars revenue coming in to our to our budget, and so that's that is a feature of of, of um, raising tuitions. But I think more importantly, it changes the kind of conversation in these Type A towns who haven't come up with an alternative to a minimum for a chapter 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 seventy four. So I think I think I think those that's that's sort of the case that I would make, um, and um, you know, just sort of uh, leave it leave it for the rest of the um, committee to talk about. I just uh, before we will actually begin the conversation, you but in the revision that's on, on the table, you'll find that uh, on the, on page the, the original copy is on page 20, 23, pages twenty three and twenty four, so you can. It basically is the, the the difference between the two is if you look at the bottom of what's on the table is that is uh, the percentage of the existing weight in, in the given years has changed but I also want to mention that at the top of the page there's a motion we're not going to, we're not voting on that tonight that would be something if uh, after a full discussion tonight and people thinking about it we would put it on the February agenda such a motion would go on the February agenda uh, Based on conversation tonight, whether we would like it to have it worded that way or whatever, that remains to be seen. But don't just set aside the notion that we're that we're voting on a motion, or putting a motion on the table. We're not. That would be in February after a full discussion tonight, and then more in February if needed about uh, what is proposed here. Yeah. 
they run that. And 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 the other thing that I sort of said said in the cover memo, that's not just the conversation around this table, but if but if there's enough of a sentiment to at least carry conversation over to February, I said, uh, you know, I would see us, you know, through the superintendent or through the individual members. Um, certainly, certainly myself within within um, Belmont, engaging engaging with the with with both the member towns and the type A towns that would be affected by it, just to make sure that they, you know, that that we go in to a possible vote on February 5th, knowing that we've we we've, we've offered a chance to sort of hear from all the parties. Right. I saw that. I've been in, I, I saw that in, the, in what you uh, what's in the packet with a note to myself of what would be the mechanism. So maybe we'll get to that in the discussion. Anybody have any questions? Alan? Or comments? It turns out to be a question. Um, I have a whole long list of them, but um, now that we're doing animal science, I'm going to say that I don't think leopards change their spots. So, um, and also we're going to have puppies now, so that means that the school will be a little quicker. But um, <clears throat> I am concerned about the politics of this, um, particularly when I see towns like Watertown on the list of communities. Um, now this is kind of a shot across the bow type of proposal for the type A communities. Um, it, I, it seems like the, the purpose of it is to say, join us or pay more, is that correct? Well, I mean, I think it's, it, I think it's to say that you should, you should pay more and, and that will help you figure out whether you want to join us. But there are other things they can do besides join us. Um, for example, the various collaborative things that other communities have gotten engaged in. Um, there are other schools that are building things right now that they might get involved with. Um, I can I can see them going in other directions besides getting together with us and not seeing it as a friendly assistance to them in making a decision, but instead being too aggressive. And so I'm, I'm worried about us actually um, losing our friends amongst the, that list. Um, and I also don't, <clears throat> I'm worried about um, making a commitment, a one-sided commitment that this is what we're doing for five years without anything from the other side, you know, that this is what they're doing. What, you know, they're not saying, we're going to bring all these kids to your school, and we're saying, right, here's our tuition package. We're saying, here's the thing. This is what it's going to be from us, and we have nothing from them. You know, we, that that bothers me. Um, no, I'm not sure what you mean. I don't bother us with it. We're putting we're putting out on the table a price list yeah. for four or five years yeah. that is very high, and and. Um, we're not, we're not getting any kind of agreement from them that they're coming to the school. We're just saying this is what it's going to cost you to come here, or you know you can infer that it would be cheaper possibly to be a member. Um, I, I just don't think that they're necessarily going to go towards being a member since they have never wanted to be a member before. I don't think this is what's going to make them want to be a member. Um, I also worry about offering a one school solution to the state, especially when right now one of their big focus points is access. They want to increase access to vocational education. There are other schools, I'm trying to remember if I've got the right list, Tri-County, Smith, Vogue, and Shelby Valley, Cape Head Tech, that have um, empty seats that we could perhaps <coughs> get together with um, and maybe try to convince the state that letting the waiting list kids come to schools like Minuteman would be beneficial. It would allow more kids to get this type of education. Um, and we could talk to them about stopping some of their practices that are de damaging to the vocational school, um, such as you know approving new programs nearby uh, when there are, by, by just um, alerting the superintendent having a conversation with them that, oh, by the way, we're going to put in a program exactly like yours down the road. 
um, <coughs> because that doesn't actually provide more access. It just dilutes the pool and actually probably creates a, a glut of people who are trained for these jobs that are available. And you're not really looking at the workforce development aspect when you do that. So I'm worried about prevent, presenting a one school solution to the state when they're in the middle of this big process of trying to get more access. Um, so that's uh, that's about half my list. What if, it, if I could ask, ask you a question? Sure. Or anyone for that matter. Uh, how do people, how do you feel, how do people feel about, I'll call it the, 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 tu the, the tuition differential between the member towns and the non member towns? Is, is that sustainable um, in, in, in the eyes of member towns to have this, a, 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 dif a differential in tuition payment or cost between the non member and member towns? I, I ask myself that a lot. Well, that's something that you bring up to the, to the commissioner and say, look, here's the analysis of what it actually costs. And this number that, that you're using is the wrong number. If we've had this discussion with them before. I can provide extensive documentation about how they used to calculate the average vocational foundation, whatever, per pupil. But they weren't actually doing it. They were just incrementing it by 3% from something that they came up randomly, a, a number with a random figure in 1993. And they just it periodically. So when they say they're using these numbers, it's worth forcing them to analyze the number and see whether it actually is a number that is relevant to the true cost of doing this type of work. Okay, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that the, 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 the point that Jim, the, the primary point that Jim brings out is that, it, uh, that um, the type A times are getting terms of they don't really have skin in the game for career tech education therefore they should be paying a higher rate where the towns who do take it seriously they get a break I have no problem with the, um, the ethics of that argument okay, I think that the argument is, uh, is absolutely correct I think that Alice is right though that the primary consideration there are lots of irons in the fire with respect to getting to our goal. Okay? This is one possible approach to it. In this approach, what we do is we say that the reason you're going to consider joining is because that uh, free ride you get is being taken away. And then once the free ride is taken away and you're paying the fair rate, then you're going to be encouraged to join the school, the district, because then you get some benefits and that uh, free ride is taken. But there are other approaches as well that will get us to the point where the school is full. Because once a school is full and they lose access to it by not being a member, then the argument in the town is going to shift. They'll say, it's great, we're getting a discount, but we can't get our, our, our kids any seats. So the discussion is not what is immediately fair to do. Uh, and now I'm partly answering David. They should feel about it. They should feel unhappy happy that the uh, tuition they're paying is greater than that of the free workers. Okay. Uh, but what is the, uh, the best approach to our goal of having the, the school filled uh, uh, primarily with in-district students? So it's the political question, which of the possible approaches we can take is going to get us to that goal quicker? which is something that's very hard to uh, predict because there are a lot of very powerful towns that would like the state to go in a particular di direction that may not benefit us. And my guess is that sort of political maneuvering is going to be the most important determinant of the outcome. So where do we put our energy? Uh, because we can't try everything. You can't go to them and tell them 10 different arguments. Which arguments are the ones that we should pursue the most? I guess one uh, one way to look at it is that if we pursue this, it might be just us doing it alone. If you pursue some of the other methods, you might get a whole bunch of towns or schools involved with you in pursuing one of the other approaches that have been mentioned, like um, allowing kids from waiting lists to come or eliminating the fact that you put the ninth 
to a Michelle Watts attended. So I'm kind of undecided on this still. I'm, I, I like the memo a lot, the way that, uh, from an ethical point of view, from a clarity point of view, it was quite good. But the, the best political way to approach this, since you can't do everything, that's the one clear in my mind. I, I haven't heard Ed's opinions yet. So I hope that we're going to hear at least something from him this evening as well. So I'm undecided. other things, saying that we ought to focus on increasing involvement of member towns and keep, keep our focus on that and not necessarily take any side packages or side steps at this point. I, I know you've said a lot about that. Oh, no, that's not. Okay, I guess it goes on. So, uh, no, I think that we, we should uh, something about what's happening in the 
attract political climate. Um, uh, I know that they're working very hard on the Chapter 74 formula, right? So it's going to be a winner or loser there. Um, I don't know how that's going to impact all these issues that we're interested in, if it, if it um, impacts it at all. So I do think that um, it, it's not just a case of you know sitting back and letting things happen. I think we should be activists in some direction. I just don't really have a feel for which one is the best one to do. Okay, that clarifies it for me. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I remember too that the difference between the tuition that is allowed by the current regulations yeah. and <coughs> our average cost per student is much wider because we're under enrolled. If we bring kids in at, at any tuition, it helps to narrow that gap. And I know it can't get it there all the way with the seats we have available, but I'm keeping that in mind as well. I think my answer to you, Dave, is yes. I think we need all these things are, and I don't mean this in any drug term, are diversions. We need to work on increasing enrollment. We need to spend 100% of our time on increasing enrollment. We need to invest in increasing enrollment in our budget. And that's what we should do because we haven't done that in the past. We've done things, but I think we need to do more. What I'm saying is what we've done to date is correct. We need to do a lot more. And I just think that's where we should do our focus. I think if I looked at my town, sends this many students. We paid 90, over $95,000 per student last year. This year, I think it's around $76,000 per student, okay? And now we would consider giving a discount to other towns to come in, and over a period of time, they'd, they'd make it up. No, I don't think that's right. So I think you're either a member or you're not a member. Most of the towns, probably all the towns, that got out wanted to reduce our enrollment. They were talking about 400 students in our building. And then they wanted to change the agreement. And they did a great job in changing the agreement so they could get out. I'm really much more interested in towns that want to invest in Minuteman and work for Minuteman and recognize the type of education we do here. We need to do a better job communicating with our district members what kind of a school this is. So that's sort of where I come down. And it doesn't change from what I came down last time. Anyone else have anything to Yes, Jennifer. <clears throat> All right, so from Lancaster's point of view, and I've discussed this a bit with the Finance Committee, um, equity and tuition would be huge for us. We send a lot of kids very little money. It's a huge part of our budget. Um, and it's not getting better for us. Um, and I think the idea of full enrollment with some out of district students might ease some of that. I'd like to see what that comes out as. But the fact is, then you're still subsidizing. We're still subsidizing other people. I mean, for us to subsidize Lincoln's kids, drives people's nuts in my town. You know, that is just unacceptable. They spend t almost twice what we do on regular education kids in that town. And they can't pony up the money to send their kids here. Um, so in that sense, Jim's proposal makes a lot of sense to me. I do see some conflict with if we're going to try to entice Watertown in, does this force them to try to find another solution that solves the problem without them having to pay to this extent? Um, so I'm kind of torn. Um, and I and frankly, I'm not sure, given the indications from, from the commissioner, from Desi, that it, it would fly. For one, for one district. Um, and as Alice said, they don't like to do things for one small cadre of people because that's going to make the other cadres really unhappy. So, um, and by saying no, I've just said yes, no, maybe. Um, 
But that's you know, it's a it's a hard call for me. I think I can see maybe waiting a year, see where we are, see where we are with next year once we've got the new building, see where we are when we get the kids in. I want this, <laughs> and, and Lancaster wants this, but I also see the benefit of enticing a town like Watertown into the district and then having every be, you know, fill the school. And then we don't even have to worry about this. Sue and that Jeff. So. Thank you, Sue. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I'm coming down on the, um, the very plus side of what Jen was saying. Um, I think more and more I feel like if we believe and we know that this school is one of the best around and we know that member communities benefit a lot from being part of this district and we're improving the school in so many ways, not just the building but the programming, the academy model and all that. I say we just make the statement that we are worth it. tuition equity is really important also for towns like Arlington really important. We'll get more support from Arlington community if we pursue this kind of approach than if we don't. And I think it just, it's consistent. I think we should take the high road, say, this school is absolutely worth it. I'm worried about, you know, looking at all different approaches and worrying about the politics because we won't get anything done that way, right? I mean, we'll just keep talking about this. We'll be talking about this in three years and um, my, I, I guess I'm just saying that I, I think Jim did a great job of laying this out, and I don't <clears throat> see the downside of submitting a memo to Desi. I'm, that's what I say. Jeff and then Alice. Oh, well, as, as I was reading through the memo, it occurred to me that one of uh, Desi's complaints is that we don't want a unique situation for one school. If you could kind of cut that Gordian knot and come up with a compromise and say, okay, Desi, here's what your policy should be. You want to keep the 125 for type B schools, 125%, go to 150% for the type A schools. Okay, that way it's not a simple formula for every single different town. You're going to get some closer to your uh, real tuition and it'll eliminate one of their complaints. We were doing something special for one town and simplify the calculation. Under you keep it 125% of um, foundation for the type B schools, go back to 150% for the type A schools. A simplifying compromise that may make it more palatable for them. That's just one of the thoughts I have to leave that I just want to add one more thing to my excitement. You know, we don't want to do something for one school. Well, what are we doing for Waltham? They're putting 15 minutes down the road and they're putting in Chapter 78 programs when they could send kids here. They're doing the same thing in Attleboro. They're putting them in their regular high schools instead of using the career tech schools that are in the area. It's absolutely ridiculous. And that's what not we should only be working on. Mavo and everybody, they should be working on that. And perhaps they have, but you got to stop that. Waltham kids should be here. Alice. Um, I've, I'm having this experience of, we've already discussed this a few years back, there was a great deal of pressure on this committee to increase the out-of-district tuition uh, a number of years back, and I believe the end result was that we had a reduction in the number of kids coming from the out-of-district towns, no? Remember, uh, oh, it's since you've come here, we, we increased, we voted to increase out-of-district tuition in Yep, and, and because we don't know yet what the first couple years are going to be like in the new school and the population of kids are going to be there, it's a risky move when you haven't even moved into the building to increase the tuition when you have that history. Um, it, that uh, Jim and then I mean, there, um, there are a lot of points here that I want to that I want to get back to. Um, one is that, you know, this there is not a lot more work here. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's simply you know 
next in, in, in three weeks do you want to come and vote and then we send it off to Desi and and we let the commissioner under the guidance of the board figure out whether this is something that they want or not and if they say no we're at the same same up place and so there's not a lot of regulatory risk risk there we shouldn't I mean we should we should be mindful of what the deputy of commissioner says but the process is that the commissioner is 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 going to act under the guidance of the board, not what the deputy deputy commissioner says. Um, the the whole Jeff, I mean, I'm totally in, a, in agreement that I would love to see the access regs change. Those are all focused on Type B towns. This is focused on Type A towns. We can do both. You know, we don't have to we don't have to pick either or. And 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 the sooner we we sort of get this settled the one way or the other, the more the rest of us can can turn our attention to, 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 to dealing with the access questions you know, on, 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 uh, you know, on, you know, on um, type, type of B. In terms of the, how, a, how a town re, re responds to a change in, in its cost of sending kids here, we have a very, a much closer example. And, and when the six declarant towns left, that their cost of sending students dropped. It dropped by it dropped by eleven thousand dollars. What happened? Because because they were no longer members, they 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 were no longer, um, you know, uh, they were no longer part of part of the same kind of re recruitment process. That their enrollment has dropped off, and so it shows that the enrollment numbers are much more sensitive to what whether that town cares about sending kids here, not not what the uh, um, not what the dollar dollars of the tuition are. In terms of the political stuff, I mean, you know, that the declarant towns are one group, and I think, you know, Ford sort of talks in Dover terms about what the impact is. It, it is the one percent capital cost that is keeping the average cost for the declarant towns in Dover very high. But if we want to deal with that, we can we can think at some point about changing the regional agreement to sort of bring you know bring those costs down to um, the average cost. This tuition stuff really is focused on Watertown, as you uh, as as you pointed out, and it's also focused on Belmont. That's on track to become um, become a type A type A town. I mean, I'm I mean, I, I, mean, I live and breathe breathe the politics in those in those towns. I mean, I know if if I thought this was going to be a political nightmare, I wouldn't bring it here. I have met with the Watertown School Committee chair. I met with the with the state reps and the state senator there, just to give them a heads up that we're talking about this, because I didn't want them to be surprised by it. Um, I, I I met with the Belmont School Finance sub subcommittee this this morning just to say this was a, a possibility, and they're prepared to sort of do their political work in prior to next February fifth. And so, if if it's going to be a a um, a political blow up. We will we will know before 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 we um, we vote. I, mean, I will I will I will try to de-risk this as much much as a, as as a possible. So um, the waiting a year. I mean that's that's exactly what this new uh, piece piece it does. It says you know we aren't we aren't changing the formula for next year. Type A towns are going to have to pay the capital cost next next year. You know by starting it now, it actually does. Give us a year, so to see how Desi Desi works out. And plus, if it turns out that it that it's not going to fly, you know this this body can change it too. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't lock us in to um, you know to a fail safe. We have to follow this. It gives that it raises the possibility of what we 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 can can do. So I just want everyone to you know think about whether this is as risky as it sounds. And, and in fact, I'm saying, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's been baked. It's been a lot of back and forth. It's it, it is it is something that I think is ready to at least, you know, go and it, and and find out find out what Desi says. Sorry, I need to take. Um, you, you know, it's interesting listening to the conversation. I find that I've agreed to with what everyone has said, even if things that have contradicted each other. 
you know, the, the reality is, is that there's a political cost to doing something. There's also a political cost to not doing something. And it's figuring out what is in the best interest. And I think that, like, weighing those political costs are, is something that many of us are still doing. And ultimately, I think it does come down to what Ford was saying, is that it really needs to be a priority to fill with member towns. So, and I know I'm still weighing Yeah, I'm pleased with how this has evolved, mainly not how it's ended up, but because of the process has been an honorable one, and I appreciate it. I see this particular issue as really a two-step issue, and some of you have alluded to that. I think how the steps are taken is more important right now for a minute man. For instance, I think the commissioner can make the decision without escalating this to the board level. I think if this, so let's just say for instance in my mind, there's one vote that the school committee would submit this. And then depending on what the commissioner says, there'd be a second vote whether or not to implement it if in fact it was approved. I, th I see it as two distinctive steps. And one of the values in the evolution of this that Jim just alluded to was that it wouldn't be impacted for another year. That vote probably wouldn't come up for at least perhaps another year, maybe 10 months. And during that time, we would learn about DESE, but the most important thing we would learn about is enrollment. Uh, we're on track. We're, we're well above our expectations right now. I mean, it was last Thursday we had a report, uh, I don't know, it was 160 member district, ninth grade, 175 member district ninth grade applications for next year. Double what was last year. We had to because there were so many. We had another 80 kids come. So just, I don't want to get off track. It's all good news and good stuff. But that's a pressure point that we will uh, leverage to the max. You'll see more Newspaper articles, letters, you know, speaking at Rotary, that is going to put more pressure on towns like Watertown or Wellesley or, or whatever because they'll see their access slipping away without our having to take the risks that I think this vote would incur if it was done in a very public way. Let's, so let's just think about that. The commissioner disapproves it made it a very public thing, then that's going to entrench the people that aren't coming back, that don't want to come back. I just think the risks are multitude and the benefits of waiting are, are known. I mean, enrollment is one. And then, you know, enrollment is my number one thing. The building is my number one thing. Everything else falls behind that. But I view enrollment as equally dependent upon our ability to access our member town kids and way and to allow non-district students the opportunity to access these programs or at least learn about them. So for me, enrollment is those two factors. It's not either or. It's never been either or. Um, so I think uh, I think a quiet submission to the commissioner to get an answer and then a second vote to implement it allows this to move forward. And what we can say quietly, if it does move forward in this, in this way to our Belmonts and Watertowns and say, hey, we submitted this. That's all you got to say. It's not a hammer. It's not going to force anyone to join. I don't think forcing people to join by uh, threatening higher costs is going to get the right town for the right reasons in this district. That's my opinion. Carrie? So if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's not about what's being proposed, but how it's proposed, how At it's this presented. Moment, yeah. So um, in my mind. instead of the coming across being presented as if it's a will you approve, it 
it's um, what's your opinion of, what's your feedback, and it just sort of yeah, I think the, among friends and not a formal request. Of in my Is experience with the previous commissioners, that they've been able to give us pretty solid feedback about these kinds of things, enough so that you can bank on it. I mean, sometimes, Jim, I get the impression mm -hmm. that you want you want to bring it to the Bessie level, mm -hmm. um, and I. That's the part that makes me very uncomfortable. Uh, if there was a, a less public, a less statewide way to get an answer on this particular formula, I would welcome the answer. Because the answer has absolutely no bearing on whether or not we will be. Sure. I can tell you that in, in Concord, the increase we have seen in not only the assessment, but in the per student and mm -hmm. no assessment has been dramatic. Um, and we're not even at the top of the curve yet on our four-year average. We've got 25 kids here this year, and I think our average is like 19 or something like that in that neighborhood. Um, so we've got a long way to go, and we're over $40,000 per kid. Um, that's a lot of money. I mean, it would be nice to go back to my, um, you know, finance committee hearing and saying we're going to work on bringing that down by increasing the out of district tuition. But I want to be very careful and very deliberate about the way we do that and not risk cutting our throats partway through the through the rock. I mean, I I would love it if Watertown and Belmont got together and said our long-term interest is best served by, by you know, joining or rejoining and remaining within the district. And I think that would go a very long way towards filling the seats along with the incentive to our current remaining members. There is there's not a single Belmont point of view, or there's not a single Watertown point of view, but there's a lot of different points of views within those towns about about this. And what we're, what I see is that the, the voices for making sure that the eighth grade kids have got access to the best vote tech choices there are in competition with the financial focus voices in, in town. And they're both from Belmont, you know, and, 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 and you know, and they're both, both, both in Watertown. And this is, you know, this is, this is, this in my mind would provide support to the, to the voices who are focused on making sure that the kids have got have got the options because because it takes away one of the harder um, uh, uh, issues that they've got to fight on the other side of the financial type say yeah yeah but there's so much to be saved by not um, um, by not enjoying so it's you know Belmont Watertown politics is much more complex because there are a lot of different there and, 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 and this proposal has got to be viewed in that context. Now, Ed, I'm curious about what what would be a uh, the mechanism, if I use that word again, for a quiet submission, quiet submission of the money to the to the uh, to Well, I could ask. Project. How does that, how would that go about? How would that occur? Well, if, assuming that you, s s you stay with the outline of time, February 5th, in between now and February 5th, I could talk to the commissioner Just talk and ask to the them, you know, this is what we're thinking about. How can we get your answer without escalating into a big formal agenda item on a board or state board? So it would be something you would do vis-a-vis? -vis I could do that. If this board would want me to, or it's up to you. Karen? That's sort of how we got the asking Kevin to ask quietly. Um, and so I think you're trying to respond to that. His, his advice was, if this is what you want, <coughs> you better give us a really good argument. Um, I guess this sort of asks, your, your proposal would be asking the same question, now armed with a few more pieces of argument, but still keeping it sort of superintendent to commissioner and not involving all the power. 
this is sort of this is what we've sort of built up around. I mean, I mean, I really respect the the deep relationships that it, it has with it has with the Odessi, um, uh commissioner and staff. And um, you know, if 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 this is if this gets us to yes, then of course I'm going to be for it. You know, um, the issue is that if it gets to to no, you know, then. You know, then, I mean, the, um, I mean, we do have, you know, that we, that, that, that a more public way is, is, is the way to get one final, you know, you know final crack, crack at it. But I'm, but I'm, I, 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 it's, it's, it's as important to me as anything to sort of make sure that we're much on the same page, page on this, so. Okay, anything else? Yeah, Jeff, Jennifer, you have your hand. Well, I suggest that we revisit this in the February meeting, and in the meantime, give Ed the authorization to approach with, with this information and the argument. Yeah. I, I don't think he needs our authorization to show right. what the approach was. Maybe, maybe as one piece of the broader picture, yeah. <clears throat> what you mean by that, Alice? It, it, the other piece would be hearing from the commissioner. In the, in the, no, be. it's just that the Department of Education. I have heard from a few different people that the previous commissioner said that almost all of his time. That's the kind of thing they say over there. And so there is some of that. So um, you don't want to spend the commissioner's time only on the one thing without having these other things in the mix, in the discussion, um, in case he just says no. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, I mean, it's fine to prove to, to put the whole context in, but we're not going to put everything in front of them on this. I mean, I mean, we haven't done the similar kind of research in terms of the access stuff and the whole. I mean, it's 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 a whole different kind of cons constituency that he's dealing with. You know, you, you don't want to draw in the kinds of really negative comments that you got in the public comment period from you know from the from you know, from the type type of B towns. I. I, I you know, this is a this is a, a pretty straightforward ask at this point, and we shouldn't layer a whole bunch of other kinds of conditions on top of it. And are you are you sort of clear how you feel about what you would ask, you, how you would just present it and, and talk to the commissioner? About it? In my previous conversations with him, he's very. Describing how this access issue is viewed regionally, not just from the point of view. Because Alice is spot on. There is no one school solution to this issue of access. In some places, they don't have enough kids. Other places, there's waiting lists. It's a distribution of, of access that I think um, the Department of Ed is trying to think through. I just wanted to point out that neither do I see it as a one one town or one district advantage to improving the access because that serves a greater economy regionally without without hard lines that you know, fit around this district or that district. It's, you know, rising tides raise all ships kind of thing. It's true here. Okay, I think.
think it's time to bring this discussion to a close. And, but I, my understanding is that uh, not everyone has, has spoken in favor of that or, or certainly they're, they're not opposed either. To Ed, talking to the commissioner to get the commissioner to read on this notion of, of raising tuition for uh, the type A town. And that, so Ed, have a conversation with Jeff Riley on whether or not Jeff would put anything in writing. I don't know if that remains to be seen, but it'd be interesting to hear, hear back from Ed what his conversation was uh, with the commissioner about this topic and perhaps about other things that, that are part and parcel of the whole notion of access and cost. Uh, any objection to that? Okay, so we'll end the discussion and Ed, so we'll put this back on the agenda for the February 5th meeting and I certainly look forward to hearing from you after your conversation with Jeff Riley, who I've met a couple of times and is terrifically white, but I go to it have the inside track or have had the breadth of conversation with him that uh, Ed, Ed has had and will have. Okay, thank you very much and thank you, Jim, for your work. As always. Okay, moving along to. Um, uh, the intermunicipal agreement, which is here, we'll, we'll wait. That will take place in the executive session. So we'll move along to Jack Dillon. Oh, sorry, we're going to make yeah, I make an announcement about that. I'm sorry, Ken. Thank you. Go to number four. So we'll hear from the enrollment task force at the next meeting. I, sorry, I didn't mean to skip over that. But. but that was the point, was to let you know that they have not met and will meet and will they'll have a full-blown presentation for us at the February 5th meeting. Did you have a question or a question? Um, yeah, I'm wondering if there's any, was the 175 the applications, or do we actually know how many kids have said they went down there? And that compares to, it's virtually twice as many? Uh, any questions for Pam? All right, then we will move on to uh, the, to uh, the principal report, and goal number five will take care of the Thank you, Dave. So I just wanted to share some good news uh, with regards to PSAT scores uh, for the 10th grade, and that's approximately 45 students. Um, the Minuteman scores in English were 499 compared to the state average of 480. Minuteman scores in math were 507 compared to the state average of 478. That was for our sophomores. <clears throat> for juniors, and that was 51 students. The Minuteman scores in English were 529 compared to the state average of English, which was 512. Minuteman scores in math for juniors was 530 compared to the state average, which was 511. So just good news with regards to our students taking the PSATs. Uh, last year, you'll remember that I came to you with not so much a full revamping of the attendance policy, but basically how we're going to manage the attendance policy. And we added more layers of support to support our students and parents. 
So last year at this time, our, our overall attendance rate was 94.3%. This year, it's 96.25%. Uh, the state average is approximately 94%. Uh, I'll be honest with you, we have about 10 students that um, having some problems with the attendance pro uh, policy, but we knew that they would last year. Um, those, those are usually issues around mental health and medical situations, but we're dealing with those. And, again, providing more um, layers of support when needed. So but it's an increase, which is good. That's it. Any questions for Jack? Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Moving on to school building report four. Um, Part A. And the we are on time, on budget. Uh, both the north side of the campus and the south side of the campus pretty much completed with drywall. Uh, so we're now looking at things that look like real classrooms. Um, ceiling grids are going in uh, the buildings now, the grids that hold up tiles. So above there is all your plumbing and lights and electrical work. So that's moving along. Um, in those two areas, and as you know, we're all we're closing in. Um, windows, have, I think they're all installed one, I haven't seen it since last week. There's one they were working on in the uh, dining area, but I bet that's in by now. So they're making great progress. Uh, one thing I think I noticed more than anything uh, last week when I walked through, how clean the building is. And uh, Gil Bain has a crew of four people that go around and they clean up. And in any construction site, that shows you whether it's a good site or not. It's how clean it is, and, and uh, you don't see papers blowing around and all that. It's, they're really taking care of it and doing a great job. So uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but over the holiday season, the students uh, took a, a holiday uh, lunch for 160, 70 some odd students uh, from the team work that we approved, which is great. Work the work crew. For the work crew, yeah. Uh, excuse me, for the work crew. Um, and again, on the website, if you go on there, you'll see our latest uh, latest video. Yeah, I saw that today. It was great. Yeah. Everything is, is going well. Good. The next item is the approval to change the Massachusetts School Building Authority project amendment, which I believe we voted on before. With, with Jeff. Uh, however, um, we didn't have our current chair, Dave Horton's name on there. The MSBA got that. For some reason, they went to our attorneys rather than to us. Uh, but uh, we are now correcting it through this vote. So um, what I would like to do is move uh, the three vote items that are, are in front of you for approval. That's one vote. That's one vote. Yeah, uh, I just want you to know I'm not good for the 100 44.9 million, uh, and neither was Jeff. With, but this, for some reason, I was good for it. Jeff was good for it. <laughs> he signed a form. So, so that's why you didn't want to be chair again, right? Anyway, that's it. But MSBA, for some reason, MSBA, for some reason, wants the current chair to be on it. It's a pro forma act. Do I, do I hear a second? I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? No. None. Yes, out. Nine zero zero. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, when when I there were times when I was acting as when I was the not the recording secretary, but in Pam's situation, I was the constable because when, when the warrants went out to all the towns to vote on that there was going to be an election on, on, the, on bonding the Minuteman School, I, I had to hand deliver somebody to, as const, I was called the constable that would hand deliver the warrant to the, to the 16 towns. So do some, it, do some interesting things. Pardon me? The letter of the law. Yes, 
Yes, yeah, yeah, all people. Okay, uh, we're now moving on to item seven, Kevin Mahoney. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As you note on um, page 35, uh, you'll see our uh, estimated revenue plan, and on page 36, a summary of our projected FY20 uh, assessments by a uh, by member of town. Um, essentially, um, the administration has concluded its, uh, its recommendation uh, that we'll be presenting on February 6th and we held uh, uh, meetings with the finance uh, subcommittee. Uh, the subcommittee chair will report on that in, in the next report. But just to highlight some of the things, um, <coughs> The recommendation of version 3.04 you hasn't changed from the last update that, that, that I provided. We just had to do some um, adjustments when it became, um, became known that we were going to have a change in our administrative staff and, um, due to retirement, so we're looking to bring on an assistant in the, uh, in the uh, vocational technical uh, director position as, a, as part of our succession plan. To uh, what we saw uh, an opportunity in the health insurance account. That's the primary shift from the, from the last time around. So, some of the things that we'll be talking about at our public hearing on February 5th will address uh, some of the uh, items that we've included in the budget, being mindful of uh, going, into the new, going into the new building. Some of the things, obviously, will be the, the impact on the debt service capital fee was calculated, uh, new programs, particularly the multimedia engineering that will be going into a, a brand new space, um, additional assistance, uh, logistics, um, uh, uh, warehouse manager, manager type person, a point five position to assist in the, uh, in the warehouse management. Uh, director of facilities, we have to rethink the way we, we handle the, the building maintenance and the facility maintenance. Uh, and the campus maintenance, uh, given some of the discussions we've been having about our athletic facility as well, and um, you know, some some uh, th there is some funding for uh, equipment, but not a not a significant amount. Uh, fortunately, uh, as, as we've reported in the past, between what we've been able to include within the um, within the project budget and some of the uh, investments we've made over the last four or five years in anticipation of this move, as well as successful grants um, that we've been, um, we feel as though will be uh, adequately uh, <coughs> adequately funded and, and uh, outfitted with the, the necessary equipment to move into the new building. We're working as part of the, um, with, uh, as part of the project, um, how our furniture and fixtures bid will come in. We're working with MSBA in a collaborative bid for some of that classroom furniture that we're anticipating to have those by the end of the month. Um, uh, one of the things I would like to point out that we talked about the Finance Committee is uh, some of the conversation uh, that the, uh, the School Committee had at the, at the last meeting, you recall. Uh, there was a discussion about um, perhaps uh, appropriating a sum of money in next year's budget for a marketing uh, effort, whether that's a consultant, whether that's some type of initiative um, to move forward with, 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 with a marketing uh, campaign. Um, one of the takeaways that that we've also heard, not only at the last meeting but prior meetings, was uh, a need for um, increasing our social media presence, a need for improving our website, looking at uh, branding to see, you know, as we go into a new building, um, how how we uh, rebrand ourselves. And Give it, give it a whole new look. Um, so uh, I've been working closely uh, with George Clement on this, and the administration has taken, taken a lead to develop a request for a proposal that, that will cover the website development, the branding, some marketing initiatives, um, logos, things of that nature that, um, that we'd like to, like to issue. We're estimating that to be somewhere around thirty to forty thousand dollars. Given the procurement requirements, um, we, we would need to send it to three 
uh, qualified vendors in that space to respond to the RFP and uh, the RFP basically allows us to evaluate the proposal based on the uh, based on uh, predetermined criteria that we set in terms of experience and, and um, you know work in this space work in public schools uh, etc so we're not bound by the uh, by the low price so uh, when when um, in March, uh, well, excuse me, in February, it's, I'll be going back to the Finance Subcommittee for Budget Transfers and looking for a sum of money based upon the bids we get uh, to fund this fund this initiative. Um, looking forward into the Fiscal 20 budget, we have not specifically <coughs> added 100000 or a sum of money um, to continue additional marketing initiatives that may be envisioned going forward. Um, some of the discussions that we've had have been more sort of uh, overviews, not really, uh, so we don't have a high level of specifics that we can work through now, given where we are in the budget. However, um, we have been made aware over the last couple of weeks of some uh, this, uh, staffing changes due to anticipated retirements that we've been able to identify about $40,000 like to do once the budget is passed is to earmark those funds um, towards a mar marketing initiative in FY20 so that when we move forward into developing what the marketing plan ought to be or needs to be, that we have funds uh, at least to kick that initiative uh, off going forward. So we talked about that at the Finance Committee. I'll let the, uh, the Chair of the Finance Committee speak to that either now or in the next, in the next update. But, uh, but that's where we are with, with the uh, with the FY20 budget. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions people have. All I've, I've notified just about all of the, uh, the local officials about what their assessment is um, projected. The only thing I can anticipate seeing changing the assessments would be any changes that come out of the governor's budget in relates to Chapter 7. But outside of that, I'm hoping that the estimates are such that they will be material. Kevin, could you talk just a little bit on maybe Carrie can how we saw it. we talked at the finance committee, the uh, finance committee, maybe in the office. I lost track. We met right after each other about how the enrollment committee might interface with the, uh, the school initiative. Yeah, thank you, Dave. I, I meant to point that out. One of the things that was suggested um, was to make sure that the administration aligned with with the with the strategy that's moving forward with the enrollment subcommittee, so that when we uh, when we issue the RFP, we share those uh, we share those uh, that information with the enrollment subcommittee to make sure that it's capturing all of the components that uh, the that the enrollment subcommittee has been working on. So the administration is working independent of the of the enrollment subcommittee. So we have a draft, and I think it's our intention to do that uh, so that we. I guess this would just go into my subcommittee report. Uh, are there any, unless there are any other questions yeah. for Kevin on what yeah. we would like to get to. Yeah. I would have better expand a little bit on what you want to do. Well, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to really make a statement. I spoke to both Kevin and Ed because I was going to say something. Um, I am very appreciative of what's been done in the past and what we're doing at Minuteman. I have absolutely no complaints or problems about that. I am very appreciative of what Pam just said, and I think that's great. And what Kevin just said, I just want to say I don't think we're doing enough, and I think we should have more money in there uh, than we're doing. I, as I told you last time, I don't. I haven't talked to anybody uh, consultant about it, but. I don't want us to find out in six months, oh, I wish we had done something else. So I'm just saying to the school committee, and I'm going to say no more on this, I'm going to approve the budget, but I think we should be doing everything possible to fill this school um, within the next year or two years. So, I think that's, so that's, that's really my message, uh, and I know that you're making every attempt to do that, so I, you know, that's not fun. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's know what's my character, but that certainly is the intent of the enrollment committee, uh, subcommittee, working, interfacing with the, the initiative that the, that the administration is proposing. Carrie can talk more about that. Okay. Um, 
sort of picking up on other things that have been said, finance subcommittee realizes, of course, that um, full enrollment, whether it comes from a combination of out of district and in district students or primarily in district, however we get there, it benefits all of our, our member communities on a per student cost basis. Obviously, if we're all members, it benefits us more because of more money coming per student. But there'll be fewer towns to, to carry the burden. So uh, we're looking at that, obviously. We've, we've, as I said earlier, we've come a long way on, on discussing Jim's proposal, and we really appreciate um, the changes that he has made, uh, modifications as he went along. That's that's one thing. The second piece is the is the marketing, which we have talked about at um, a couple of meetings now, uh, specifically focusing on it after the board came to give a pitch a few meetings ago. Uh, I think that the reason we haven't put a line item in there for a hundred thousand dollars for marketing is we want to know more specifically what would be done uh, in in terms of spending the money. So. We've got a, a few ideas floating out there, but what Kevin has talked about for this year and next year, we remain flexible and open. We're not saying we shouldn't be spending the money, but we don't necessarily see it as one line item that's going to appear in the budget as $100,000 per month. There's, there's a lot of different ways to achieve that. Um, and, we, and before something gets put in a written budget, we want to know what it is. And, and you know, we can be because we can move money from one line item to another over the course of the year, we have that flexibility. Okay. Okay. I think you just answered my question, which was going to be the timing. If through the RFP process we find we can't do for the amount of money what we need to do, um, how does that timing work with the budget timing if we find that no, we need to either double, triple, and we can we can move money from one category to another. We can't increase the budget. Uh, in the past, similar situations have arisen in which we did need money for a particular category like this. The money was found. So the question is, you don't want to allocate a specific amount because you don't know what you're going to put in it yet. I'm not concerned about enough money. If we come up with the right ideas that everybody agrees on, I'm not concerned about the money not being available. I think the money will be available. I think we have to see, we're going to see soon how aggressive uh, both the enrollment committee and the marketing ideas are. It'll probably take another month or two before we see how aggressive it is. I think you're going to find it very aggressive. And the money for reasonable efforts will be forthcoming. It's happened in the past. I'm not concerned that it's not a line item particularly a line of the budget for this year. That's sort of the way we envision it. And, and, um, and uh, just on the average cost in Section 10, that'd be, you know, there, there are three numbers on here. If you sum two of them and divide by the third, you get 32,286, just to put some context in the organization. So. I would like to know a little bit more, I think, about how the interface is going to work between marketing and school committee enrollment and all that because, you know, it's possible to spend a lot of money and not get too much done if things are not coordinated. Um, so do we, have a, do we have thoughts about a process for making that happen? I think the process that we have, which is a more robust So, for example, is George, does George meet with the enrollment committee? I don't actually know that. Yeah. Oh, okay, then I feel much better. Thanks. And, and I think the other, 
the other piece just to add to that is that the enrollment task force is coming back and reporting. We'll be reporting at every school meeting so that there's accountability, you know, working with the administration, but the task force also has accountability for the school committee. Okay, anything else on Surplus, surplus, surplus property, Kevin? Yes, uh, thank you. This is sort of a regular monthly item on the agenda. I've been trying to move stuff into surplus so that we can then move forward and, and, and sell it. We've been, we've been actively doing that. Um, there are two, two sets of, uh, of specific uh, property that I'd like to uh, ask for a vote of declaring surplus, but need to explain it a little bit more here. Um, in terms of the first group, the, uh, the, the, the dental equipment from the, uh, the dental assisting program that we haven't had in a number of years, we've identified uh, that equipment. That would be uh, a request just for a straight declaration of surplus so that we can post that on the, on the website and, and start to sell that property. Uh, the second uh, the second item is the, um, what many of you will remember is, is part of the ESCO uh, project. It's basically boilers, chillers, and the um, switch gears. And you'll see that itemized in, in great detail on, on page 38. In working with our, uh, with our project team, uh, we've uh, had discussions about the appropriate disposition of property and um, as we know the building is going to be uh, it's going to be demoed um, late summer and fall and um, as part of that demo there's a, there's, a, there's a value that's placed on this equipment by the uh, by the demolition contractor um, which really doesn't amount to uh, to much in, in the big picture um, there is there may be an opportunity that we'd like to explore that we haven't fully vetted yet um, to to sell this property. There may be a project where there's the timing may work where it could work for another, for another facility. Um, and we'd like to explore that to see if we can gain more value from the, uh, from the property. Um, we'll be working with our energy consultants who worked with us on the ESCO project uh, in conversations with her in the past, she seems to think there may perhaps be a market. Also, in talking to our architects at KBA, they've had experience where there may be a market for this equipment. Um, so we may be able to realize more, more value by selling it. Uh, the intention here is just to ask the committee to declare it a surplus. We won't be posting it just yet um, until we explore what our best, best options are. We determine that we'll, we'll come back and report on how we're going to what the disposition of this should be. Uh, I'll, I'll remind you that we still have um, uh, an outstanding lease for this property that'll have a balance of about two million dollars on it um, at the time that we roll into fiscal 21. So we're also exploring with uh, uh, Bank of America Capital Markets. They hold the what options we may have, if we have any prepayment options, um, just to see how we can uh, address the lease issue uh, while we're well, moving forward with some of the equipment. Thank you, Jeff, and then uh, Jim. Okay, so uh, just as a, a brief reminder, a number of years ago we had a near disaster in terms of the uh, um, electrical switch gear that we had at the time was failing. And could have meant a elimination of electricity to the school, which is a bad thing. And uh, replacing this equipment, there's sometimes a lead time. And we didn't really have a good way to pay for it, so we bundled it in the ESCO project is what we did. So we, we had this ESCO project that we were discussing uh, to save you know, energy and to be able to spend money without going to all the member towns, which is what you do in the ESCO project had this issue with this switch gear and the cooling tower, which um, was hazardous, my recollection. 
So he purchased this equipment. This yeah. It's a bad thing. Uh, so we purchased all this equipment as part of we we integrated it into the ESCO. So this is the electronic switch gear that we're currently using, right? So that's great. It's not surplus in the sense that we can take it out now and give it to somebody. We need to keep it until the building is ready to go. And so right. And so what you're saying now is that there may be some value to this equipment that we can get back and pay off some of the, the debt that we have. That we are referring to. Yes, more than the salvage value that the, the, the demolition contractor may get far. We'd like to explore that option. Yes. Well, it makes sense to me. Before we continue the discussion, can we have a motion to approve the disposal? Did you get the two names? Okay, and then we'll continue the discussion. Uh, I, call, I pointed out Carrie and then Jim and then Howard. Do you Howard. already have uh, the estimated salvage value from the contractor, or is that yet to be determined? We're still working. <laughs> How, how many years are left on the lease? I believe it's uh, five. Yeah. I think it's, uh, um, I mean, believe it's, uh, I mean, even, it's even if the, uh, fiscal 25. Yeah. So, so even if the, the, the equipment is placed out of serv service, wouldn't it make sense just to sort of let the lease payments go rather than putting a, a $2 million hit into, you know, fiscal Yeah, we were just exploring different options. Yeah. I just and 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 and, uh, and to those those uh, lease payments, we still charge all sixteen towns, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, when you put it on the bid site, do you also notify the member towns that these things are going to come available? Just not typically, yeah. but we 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 certainly um, we could run an ad in the newspapers, but we don't necessarily. Yeah, contact might, our member towns. They have these little projects that go on. They might have a use for some of them. We can certainly incorporate that as part of this. Okay, anyone else? All right. All in favor? Any opposed? Abstain none. So it's nine zero zero. Yes, Jeff. Uh, just a comment. I find this item a little bit entertaining because at the time we were doing this, we were saying, well, what if we go into a new building? Then we won't get the full use of it, but you can't not do it because it was, you had absolutely no choice. Well, it was 10 years ago, too. So, yeah. yeah, so, and now here we are with the new building. That's yeah. a good thing. So, we have a lot of use. We've gotten a lot of use. Now we have this problem of what we do. Right, it's, it's, it, it saved the school. All right. Okay, moving along to the secretary's report. Okay, we have in the packet the minute, draft minutes of December 11th on page. 40. Given I have not heard of um, any changes or amendments, I move to approve the draft minutes of December 11th as presented. Any discussion? I had one tiny change which I sent to Julia, but I didn't copy in, uh, and that is uh, <coughs> in page, number. page number Jennifer, Jennifer, where are you? Jennifer, where are you? Thank you. Could you send, tell me, tell us, what's the page? I know, but I, I didn't hear you. I couldn't see, where, I'd like to follow page where we are. Page 43, halfway down, the spelling is for me. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, nine zero zero. Now we go into executive session. Um, and before we 
we to frame the motion, are we going? We will not. I believe we're not coming out of executive session. We're going back to open session. And who would we like to have a space of any Kevin. Okay. So, would someone like to read the motion, and then we ought to say that we will not come back to open session. That Kevin Mahoney and Julia will, the superintendent will be here. 